It's 20 to 7 now on drive. The cult leader Charles Manson has died in prison in California at the age of 83 after over four decades spent behind bars for orchestrating a series of brutal murders in the late 1960s. Manson became synonymous with the dark side of counterculture around that time, believing that the murders would start a race war and allow him to seize power. His followers were called the Manson family. They killed nine people altogether under his direction, including the heavily pregnant Hollywood actress Sharon Tate, the wife uh, at that time of the film director Roman Polanski. Now, Manson wasn't actually at the scene during any of the killings, but he was convicted for seven counts of murder. Here he is in court in 1971. I don't accept the court. I don't accept the whole situation. You know, like I was in the desert minding my business. Uh, this confusion belongs to you. It's your confusion. I don't have any confusion. I don't have any guilt. I know what I've done, and no man can judge me. I judge me. What have you done, Charlie? Well, Manson was sentenced to death in 1970. This was later commuted to life imprisonment. He gave several television interviews while he was in jail. Here he is speaking to Tom Snyder on NBC. Sometimes I feel I'm scared to live. Living is what scares me. Dying is easy. Well, for the rest of the programme, we'll be exploring who Charles Manson and his followers were, the crimes they committed, and the almost cult-like status that the group has gained since. And just to give you a little warning now ahead of uh, that, especially if you're listening with children, there inevitably may be some disturbing and graphic details to this story. Uh, and do uh, share your thoughts with us as well as we go along. 85058 on the text or at BBC Five Live on social media. Joining us then are Jeff Gwynn, an author who wrote the best-selling book Manson, The Life and Times of Charles Manson. Hello, Jeff. Hi. Uh, Nick Godwin is the executive producer of Manson, which is a feature-length drama documentary uh, about the man. Hello, Nick. Hi there. Uh, Nicholas Shrek is with us as well, a musician, author and filmmaker, a close friend of Charles Manson, uh, Manson since 1985. He wrote the book, The Manson Files, and produced the documentary Charles Manson Superstar. Hello to you, Nicholas. Hi there, how are you tonight? Uh, very well, thank you. Uh, Jeff, we'll, we'll start with you because I'm, I'm conscious that there's a whole generation, really, a younger generation who might recognise the name but know very little about the story of Charles Manson. So... Take us back, and, and how did he get from a, a, a career petty criminal, I suppose, to, to somebody who was one of the, the most evil men of his age? Well, Manson was always the wrong man in the right place at the right time. When he was paroled from prison in 1967, he was paroled in California and first made his way to the San Francisco area, Kate Ashbury in the Summer of Love where so many young people, young Americans, who were estranged from their families and wanted someone to tell them how to live, where to go, a guru was the term at the time. And some of them encountered Manson there. His philosophy was cobbled together from the Bible, Beatles lyrics, and uh, the great and well-known How to Win Friends and Influence People which is, of course, the book that, that was written and was, was a huge bestseller. There wasn't a lot original about him, but what he found was an original place to try to attract followers. From there, they migrated down to Los Angeles. That was where the really the, cent the nexus of the recording industry was located in America at that time. It moved from Los Angeles. He happened to be there at a, a time in American history where uh, the kinds of acts he and his followers got involved in became notorious. Yeah, I mean, Nick, to, to pick up on that, how did he take a place and a time that, as Jeff was saying there, was so synonymous with love and, and turn it into to something that was so deeply filled with hate? Well, I think Manson wasn't the only one uh, at the time who was acting as a sort of Pied Piper, if you like. There, there were a lot of kids out there, uh, 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 sort of late teens, early 20s, who were looking for something. I think Manson, in the end, of course, was by far the most sinister, but there were a whole proliferation of weird, abusive cults were springing up at the time. I think Manson, though took it a whole stage further. I mean, pe people say he was a very compelling character. He was uh, Vincent Bugliosi, who was the, the prosecutor, says that, you know, although Manson was completely uneducated, he was extremely intelligent and he was extremely manipulative. So he was able to take 
uh, if you like, the, the, the sort of insecurities and the, the, the desires of these kids to, to uh, 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 find something new, who after all, many, most of whom had, had run away from home or, or left home, and manipulated them using all that intelligence, but also all, all that prison prison cunning. He'd been in prison half his life, I think, by the time he uh, 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 was let out. What was it, Nick? Because I know you, that was a, a lot of what you were interested in, how people and, and who kind of fell under his spell. What, what was it that, that drew you to his story in the first place? Well, the Manson story's been told many times, and we made this film seven or eight years ago, but it, at the time it had still been told many, many times. So we wanted a new uh, uh, angle on it, if you like, and we uh, uh, tell the story very much through a character called Linda Kasabian, who was one of the uh, uh, members of a family. She, she in effect, was the getaway driver on the night of the Sharon Tate killings and she ended up turning state's evidence after that she went into hiding and had i think she hadn't spoken for 20 odd years i mean it took us six months to find her and persuade her to take part but so if you like our way of trying to understand manson was very much through her story and you know she 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 joined the family a month before the killings she thought it was great at first she was a 20 year old uh, a, a single mum who was looking for something new. A friend suggested uh, 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 going up to the ranch where, where they all were, and she said it was great at first. It was, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, and they were sort of step by step drawn further and further away from from the norm. But it, it happened pretty rapidly, the, the, the real turn to the dark side. Yeah, I mean... When, when we look at it, Jeff, and, and when we kind of pull it apart and, and, and look at all of the different layers, I suppose, what is it about the Charles Manson story that means that even now we're still talking about him and the members of the family and the crimes that he and they committed? Why do you think it's, it's lived in the psyche for so long? Well, it began, of course, in 1969. It was a time when it seemed like the whole world was coming apart, and particularly in America. There was great racial strife, great divisions over the war in Vietnam. And the Manson killing not only was horrific in and of itself, but it happened in Los Angeles, which is sort of the center of the entertainment industry. It involved an actress who was relatively famous, and, of course, her husband, Roman Polanski, much more so. And to a certain extent, after Manson's arrest, as the long, weird trial extends, it passed from just being sort of a crime story into almost entertainment, painful to watch, but you couldn't look away. You can almost think of Manson then as the equivalent, let's say, of a criminal Kardashian, that, that people just wanted to kind of watch and see what crazy thing would happen next. If Manson had been executed as scheduled, I think he generally would have been forgotten then within a generation. The problem being, uh, his sentence was commuted to life, and every few years he would do something else crazy or weird. That would keep him in the public eye, plus Vince Bugliosi's Helter Skelter. Nine million copies sold. So Manson actually became part of the culture as well as someone who was caught up in the criminal justice system. May well, I be allowed to offer an alternative? It, to sorry, the, yeah, Nicholas, is that you? Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to introduce you, Nicholas. So this is, uh, we, we, we said hello at the start. Nicholas Schreck, a musician, author, filmmaker, and friend of Manson since 1985. Nicholas, go on, what, what, what would you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted to say, with all due respect, the opinions that you said in your introduction, uh, what Mr. Gwynn has said, what Nick has said, this is mainstream media's view of what occurred. My research, and I'm the only person here who knew Manson very well and have spoken to people on both sides of the equation, people involved with the Manson commune, Manson himself, people who were friends with Roman Polanski. None of what you have said is essentially true. I will just say two points to begin with, and then you can ask what you like. Linda Kasabian was a well-known drug dealer before she met Manson. She was a professional drug dealer. The way she joined the commune, which was never called the family until the media called it that, was that she stole $5,000 from her husband 
at the behest of Charles Tex Watson, who was also a drug dealer. Linda Kasabian and Tex Watson were drug dealers in the underworld, and they largely devised and had the motive for the crimes that we remember as the Tate LaBianca murders. Linda Kasabian, <laughs> according to my research, is one of the guiltiest of the people who were involved. However, Vincent Bugliosi, whose book Helter Skelter is by any serious researcher not something that is credible because he was basically creating a prosecution case. Well, he was no. not telling the truth. The final thing, Linda Kasabian is free today. As far as my research shows, she was central to planning the crime. She was a drug dealer who was trying to get back at Jay Sebring and Wojtek Furkowski, who she bought drugs from with her lover, Tex Watson. Okay, so that's well, the first thing okay, okay. I wanted to say, then you can refute yeah, it. Yeah. Well, well, I, I, I just want to talk more about Manson himself, Nicholas, in the sense that it is indisputable that these people were murdered. So what we're questioning here, or what you're trying to question, is the level of Manson's responsibility. It's as yes, simple as I that. He, I believe he was an accessory to these murders. He is a criminal. He lived by the underworld code. He knew about the murder of Sharon Tate and the others after it happened. And he didn't call the police because he's a criminal. He went back and helped them uh, get rid of evidence. That's true. He's a, he was an accessory to these murders. The idea that this group of petty criminals and hippies was some kind of religious cult is nonsense. Okay. Uh, furthermore, the, the, the main point here, he was not the mastermind of these murders. He was scapegoated and allowed to become this figure of incarnate evil. Okay, all right. That's, that's well, well let, let's, get, let's get the counterpoint there. Then Jeff Gwynn and Nick Godwin listing in. Guys, you've heard what Nicholas has had to say. In, his, in essence, Charles Manson has been demonized along the way. Uh, Jeff, do you want to start the response there? I think the basic response is that Manson used to claim he was the man of a thousand hats, that he could appear to be anything he wanted to be, he can be very persuasive. I think what we've just heard is completely wrong, just as the person who was saying it thinks I'm wrong. I have my research, he has his. We've both put those forward in books and in film, and I think people can judge for themselves. Nick Godwin? Well, uh, that, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's a nonsense, really. I mean, you, you know, the prosecution case was tested out at trial and a jury found Manson and the family uh, guilty. So unless there is hard evidence to the counter, I think it's utter nonsense. But uh, yeah, I, wrote go, a I think it also of, goes... Well, I wrote a thousand... Okay, but, uh, but I think it also goes... I think it also goes to show the, the, the hold Manson has over people. He does have a sort of glamour and a hold over people and has, has done ever since, the, if, ever since the prosecution. One of the things that happened in California, it was very interesting, you know, in California, uh, they changed the law uh, about filming people in prison because every time a news crew went in and uh, Charles Manson was interviewed, he's a really, really compelling character and crazy as crazy as can be, but uh, 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 just to get round just to get around the problem, they stopped all filming in uh, California uh, 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 prisons for a long, long time. Let's return, if we can, Jeff and Nick, to the to the transformation of this guy. We, we, I, I don't, you know, was it? Let's talk about his classification mentally from the start, because was there a point he 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 kind of had influences within the music scene, didn't he? In L.A., he got to know one of the Beach Boys and. Um, Mm -hmm. He had pretensions at, at making his own music, didn't he? So at that point, do you think he, he was truly murderous, or was there some level of transformation? Was it drugs that, that changed Charles Manson? Well, you know, I was able I to don't find think was, sorry. people that knew Charles Manson from childhood, found his first cousin, Joanne, he lived with her, and his uncle and aunt when his mother was incarcerated. I found his adopted sister, who had never talked before. Manson, from the time he was young, was a thoroughly disagreeable, violent person. He knew how to present himself in certain ways, sometimes good, sometimes evil. One other thing just to touch on real quickly, we talk about, oh, the media invented the family. 
uh, police that name the family. That's not true. If you talk to Greg Jacobson, a close friend of Dennis Wilson and somebody who ran with him in Manson for a while, uh, Greg will tell you that the origin of the name family came out of that time, and it was something that they said about Manson and his followers. So everybody can look into things, and you can always find somebody who's known Charles Manson or even talked to Manson, and you'll hear one version or another, and it might change from day to day. People died. They died for no good reason, and Manson ever since has tried to keep himself in the public view. That's something he always enjoyed, and he knows how to play people very well. So no, there was no egregious sudden change, and he was always a pretty despicable human being. Let's bring back, uh, let's bring Nicholas Schrepp back in. Nicholas, let's put to one side the, the disagreement over over what what particularly happened and who was responsible. Let's just talk about Charles Manson for a moment, because you knew him uh, from eighty five mm -hmm. onwards. What was he like as a person? What what did you what did you discover about Charles Manson? I would say the main thing quickly that uh, general audience could understand is he played. He performed a character called Charles Manson at the court, at the trial, and in media interviews, very much to his own detriment. He played a part. He was cast as the villain and the bogeyman, and he played that part. The private person that I knew and that other people knew had elements of that Charles Manson that the public's familiar with, but I also saw the human being behind all that. He was not this sinister, evil figure of absolute dread that the media has presented for years. He was absolutely a criminal. He was a pimp. He was a drug dealer. He was not a mass murderer. And I'm not at all saying he's innocent of crimes. I'm saying the crimes have been presented wrongly. And in my book, The Manson File, I present a thousand pages of information about what kind okay. of person he was and what he did. But, but the other thing, as far as his keeping a spell over people, this was the excuse that these people used. They had the responsibility for what they did. Okay, they all right. The motive. Yes. That's my yeah, I understand that, Nick. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not closing you down, but we've only got a couple of minutes left. And Nick Godwin, I just want to move on to... The general view, because quite a few people, well, I say a handful, a small handful of people have texted the programme saying, why are you talking about Charles Manson? But I, I just want to reflect on the effect this had on society in America at the time when all these crimes happened. I mean, did you get any sense of that when you were making your documentary? I think as, 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 as both the guests have, have, have touched on, you know, what was so compelling about Manson is he also, if you like, uh, uh, signalled the confluence of uh, 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 music, I mean, pop music in a way that could never happen today. He was hanging out with what, what the Beach Boys. He was, uh, 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 he was uh, uh, trying to persuade Terry Melcher, Doris Day's uh, uh, son, a big record producer at the time, to uh, uh, produce his own music. Uh, as well as the, the, the sex, the drugs, uh, uh, the, the cult side. I think after, I think after that, I mean, what, the immediate thing that happened is there was absolute terror in LA. Uh, uh, we, we, we heard stories of, 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 of you know, the, the sale of guns, uh, 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 tripling, people buying fencing. You know, there was, I think it was a, much more innocent time. Well, it was kind of a flip. Uh, in, it was kind in, of a flip side. 60s. Yeah, it was a flip side, wasn't it, to kind of the hippie utopia that many Americans thought could could legitimately exist in the in the nineteen sixties. There, there was, but there was a crossover. It would be hard to imagine today, if you like, between the superstars and this, uh, you know, ragtag bunch of hippies led by by Manson. It's hard to imagine, you know, a, 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 a superstar band hanging out with uh, a, a people like that today. But the, the barriers were much lower back it back in the 60s uh, Jeff Gwynn final word to you we've got a, we've got a minute or so left what's your assessment of how Manson behaved in prison we, we talked earlier his uh, death sentence was commuted so do you, you often hear from people in that position where they say well that actually being in prison was worse do you get the sense by by playing up to uh, his n n notoriety that he, he, he kind of enjoyed the role of playing Charles Manson as Nicholas Schreck said he certainly did uh Leslie Van Houten told me that just before the members of the Manson followers, Manson himself, were, were captured in Death Valley, Manson told them that if he was ever arrested again, he was going to play Crazy Charlie. 
and would do that until everyone in the law decided he was so insane he couldn't be held responsible for anything, and they would let him go. He's played Manson successfully right up to the day of his death, and in that you can call the man a success. Jeff, we must leave you there. Jeff Gwynn, Nick Godwin and Nicholas Shrek. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thanks for your uh, your thoughts, your texts, your tweets. We'll see you tomorrow. It's time for Sport Now. Here's Chappers.